Welcome to The Open Door. Jim Hannink here with co-host Mario Ramos-Reyes. Today, we discuss an extraordinary murder mystery. Virgil Georgia's La Condottiera. La Condottiera is, is the tale of a, a heinous crime set amid the terrible suffering of the Romanian people under communism. Georgiou's language is starkly poetic as he charts the circles of a modern hell. Her translation of this powerful work, Inez Fitzgerald Stork, truly contributes to world literature. Two special guests, we're hoping, though they come from afar, will join her to offer us a, a mini seminar. Julio Marius Morario, Father Maxim, a Romanian Orthodox priest, holds a PhD in Orthodox theology from Babes Boyai University in Romania and a PhD in social sciences from Rome's Angelicum Pontifical University. Thierry Gillebouf is Georgiou's literary executor and the author of Virgil Georgiou, L'Escrivain Calumne. Excuse my French, it's not even high school. It's just made up as I go along. In 2014, the French Minister of Culture named Gillebouf a Chevalier des Arts de Lettres in honor of his literary achievements. Let's begin in prayer as we always do. Come, O Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit and they shall be created and you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, who has taught the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, granted by the gift of the same Spirit, we may be always truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let's begin with a starter question, although a full answer would be a very long answer indeed. I Inez, could, could you tell us a about Virgil Georgiou's multifaceted life, especially its early influences. Yes, he grew up uh, the son of a Romanian Orthodox priest. Is our listeners know Romanian the the, Ortho, the Orthodox can be married before ordination, and on both sides of his family, the priesthood goes back for generations. His father was a very, very saintly man. They lived in penury. His father was dedicated to his church. And Georgiou grew up in the atmosphere of spirituality. It was like the air he breathed. Uh, he himself wanted to be a priest, as this was almost to be expected, being the son of the priest. But he took this vocation to heart and wanted to pursue it. But his parents did not have the money to send him to the seminary. So his father uh, thought that the best opportunity for a free education was to go to a military academy. Uh, he had a tutor prepared Georgiou intensively for the entrance exam because out of hundreds and hundreds of people, only a handful were accepted. So they had to go to um, Kijanao, the capital of it was then Bessarabia, a part of Romanian Moldova. Now it's the communists took it over and it's part of, it's now the Republic of Moldova, but then it was very much Romania. And he succeeded in the exam and after a while got a scholarship. So he embarked on this military, intensive military education. Uh, even then he sensed his vocation to be a poet. He wrote many poems for the student magazine and even for other publications. So when he was still a teenager, his poetry began to be known. Then when he finished his uh, military education, uh, he deferred his military service 
and went to work as a reporter. Uh, then when he was called up uh, for military service, they made him a war reporter. He, at that time, uh, the Romanians were trying to drive the Soviets out of Bessarabia, and they were allies of the Germans. This would later come back to haunt Georgiou, that he fought together with the Germans. But the Germans were warding off the Russians. Uh, so he did a lot of war reportage. Uh, he was criticized because in getting from one place to another inside Bessarabia to get to the front, he was helped by the Germans, by a few German soldiers. And he had words of praise for these soldiers that helped him. He himself was not a fascist, but he had some detractors. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> Uh, so the, he would have to ward off these accusations of anti-Semitism, actually, for the rest of his life. Uh, and then uh, he met uh, a young uh, lawyer, Ekaterina Borbea, in the course of his reporting, and they developed a strong attraction and got married after a short courtship. Then uh, Georgiou, uh, because his wife was Jewish, he was deprived of his press credentials when the fascists had taken over uh, Romania. So he, through some connections, was named the cultu cultural attaché in Zagreb, Croatia. Then when the Soviets entered Romania to take it over, he and his wife decided to flee. Uh, they were... They were uh, detained after a series of adventures. They were picked up by the Americans. And because he had worked for a fascist government, he was detained in American camps for a year and a half. His wife also. He was in more than a dozen camps, constantly going from one to the other. So when he writes about this in his work, uh, about these camps, he has firsthand experience. And they were able to enter... France illegally, and then he settled in Paris and began to write. I So the early influences, I guess, would be the great spirituality of the Romanian people, in particular his father, his mother's love of poetry, too. Oh, uh, Thierry is saying he has a problem with his camera. Um, uh, his mother wrote a lot of poetry. It's a prayer. She prayed through poems. Uh, and his love of Romania, which was, it's hard for us as Americans to realize the connection between, I'm sure the Romanians weren't the only ones in Europe who felt a very strong connection to their country. When Bessarabia was taken over by the Russians, it was like the country had been amputated, part of it had been amputated. And there was national mourning, bells were tolling, masses were said. Uh, so that love for Romania uh, continued throughout his life. Thank you very much for that uh, background. Now, uh, a guest, uh, a guest who is the literary executor of Gorgus has has been able to join us. He's having a little trouble with his video, but not any trouble with his audio. So I'm going to ask him to, to pick up with the account that you've given us and, and perhaps tell us something about the consequences of uh, Gorgu's, uh, well, self-imposed exile from Romania. Well, we're, we're, we're here for, for you whenever you want to join in. But uh, since you're having some technical difficulties, uh, and don't we all, I, I'm going to ask Inez to, to continue uh, and tell us about the consequences of, uh, well, leaving Romania. Well, I guess the major consequence was that Georg, Georgiou never wrote any poetry. Like it is in the Jewish psalm, we hang up we hung up our harps in exile. He could no longer write in poetry. Uh, so this must have been very difficult for him. His novels are very poetic, 
extremely poetic passages. Uh, but then one fortunate consequence was that since he had studied philosophy in uh, Bucharest and uh, theology in Heidelberg after he'd been released from the American camp, he and his wife spent some time in Heidelberg, uh, he was able to be ordained a Romanian Orthodox priest in Paris. Uh, and as I mentioned, he, his, he was wrongly accused of uh, fascism and this, this caused a lot of controversy. He uh, had, was able to have his bestseller published, The 25th Hour, where the hero spends time in concentration camps of various countries, including Nazis, and over a period of more than 10 years has enormous sufferings. This, this was one of the first times that the European public had been aware of what was going on. The French at the time had a lot of pro-communist sympathies. Sartre, for example, thought that it, it was almost criminal not to be pro-communist, at least for a time. Uh, so Gabriel Marcel had written a preface to the 25th hour. And when Georgiou refused to clarify his position, uh, Marcel withdrew his preface. And this wounded uh, Georgiou very deeply. And he felt so much uh, pressure in France. Part of it was because his, the translator of the 25th hour, a Romanian, uh, there was a conflict about what she would be paid for the translation. He paid what he had said. But since it beca became an international bestseller, she thought she was due more money, so she took him to court. And when she lost, she started taking things he had written out of context and accused him of being a fascist. So Georgiou and his wife went to Argentina for a time. This only added fuel to the fire because he met with Perón, who was not seen in a good light by the French. Uh, and he finally came back and was able to continue his writing career and uh, very much functioning as a priest, giving talks. Uh, so that's those are some of the consequences. If he had stayed in Romania, he probably never would have been able to be ordained a priest. Mario, would you like to join us? When I hear of someone going to South America, I think that you probably have that context uh, very clearly in mind. Well, <laughs> yes. Um, I still remember when I read that uh, La Hora 25, the 25th hour, uh, was very well known in Latin America. I'm talking about the 80s. But uh, you said that Giorgio went to Argentina during the Peron era. That may, may have been between 48 and 55. Am I right? Right. It would have been in the early 50s. Early 50s. Okay. Okay. And the reason why he was there was he went there uh, as an exile? Well, the atmosphere in France was getting to be very oppressive with the accusations against him, the hate mail he received, the articles in the paper, and he was invited by a Catholic group to give some lectures there. So he went there to give the lectures, but also to kind of get a break from the oppressive atmosphere in France. Now, uh, to be more precise, the group who invited him was, let's say, ideologically, what type of group uh, do you know about that no, in Argentina? I really don't know what type of group. All I know is that their primary affiliation was Catholic. But actually, Georgiou met with Perón. He recounts this in an autobi autobiographical novel, The Man Who Traveled Alone. Uh, and it's very thinly veiled. But uh, Perón was a big admirer of his. Uh, he liked the 25th hour. And uh, Georgiou uh, didn't mind meeting with him. Uh, 
he, I don't think, was a Peronist. Uh, and then there were consequences when that became known. Mm. Uh, Terry says he would like to add to this uh, this answer. Uh, Thierry is currently in Paris, is he not? That's where he lives. By the way, in his book about Georgiou, the slandered writer, he goes in in some detail to the accusations against Georgiou and their consequences, as well as giving an excellent summary of all the works of Georgiou. It, it's been uh, a very helpful work for me to have. Excellent. Could you uh, tell us, Inez, about the full range of genres that uh, Gergo's work uh, encompasses? Yes, first it was poetry, and he wrote uh, a work, Calligraphy on the Snow, which was awarded a prize that he received uh, from the hands of King Carol in Romania. He That's was, a fantastic title. I like it too. Wow. Yes, I wish it had been translated into English. I haven't been able to get a copy of it even in Romanian. <laughs> uh, but anyway, um, so, and then of course the war reportage, he wrote a book about his experiences in Bessarabia, the banks of the Dniester, the Dniester River that is, are in flames. He uh, was on a submarine. Romania had one submarine uh, and is a reporter, and that submarine was attacked by the Soviets and it survived. So he wrote a book about that. Uh, and then he wrote kind of a forerunner of the 25th hour that he realized wasn't quite the novel he had hoped for, and that never got a lot of resonance. Uh, then uh, when he, in Germany, he uh, he published some uh, Romanian tales that were, were uh, translated into German. Then when he got to France, his literary career really took off. With the 25th hour, he wrote other no a number of other, other novels. He wrote biographies. He went to Arabia and learned Arabic, researching the life of Mohammed. And he wrote a book about Mohammed written as though a Muslim might have written it, but if you don't share that point of view, you would see what the weak points are in that system of thought. He wrote a book about the young Dr. Luther and a wonderful book about the patriarch Athenagoras who met with uh, Pope Paul VI and they lifted their mutual excommunications. And that's just a, a, a fascinating work where he talks about this holy, Patriarch, and one interest one interesting thing about that is that when uh, Athenagoras was first named a bishop, he went to a port city, and there there were some prostitutes there. He went directly to the home of the prostitutes, uh, talked to them, uh, offered to find them jobs, emptied out the brothel, <laughs> uh, and and uh, really rehabilitated them. That's just an aside. But then his main work was novels, and, and, and of course he wrote his memoirs. Well, we finally, and thank you for that, we finally made our connection with Thierry, and he's ready to uh, have his say on all the questions that he's heard us discuss so far. So I turn the floor over to him. Hello, everybody. I'm, coming, I'm um, speaking from France. I'm sorry for my deep French accents, but... Um, well, you've heard my, you've heard my non-French, and it must have hurt your ears. Okay. Go, go ahead. No, I, try. I, 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 will, I will still speak in, in English. I, the, I wanted to go, to go back to Argentina, and I explained there were, there were many reasons for Giorgio to go to, to Argentina. Of course, there was the, the turmoil of the Georgia's affair, the accusations. But uh, when he was in, in the American jails after the war, uh, Eva Perón was the one who sent some package to, to all the prisoners in the camps. And he remembered this, remembered this. And he was very, very, very popular in South America. And uh, he was invited by uh, Perón himself and at the beginning, it, uh, he, he, I think he, he spent some 
times in uh, in the presidential palace, and I think uh, uh, he, he, he was to write a bi biography of Peron. The 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 the, the, the the purpose of the uh, invitation was this: he had to write an uh, invitation, a uh, biography of Peron, and there was also a friend of him who was were living in uh, Argentina. The name is Vintila Oria, is a Romanian writer. They are, they, they were they were born the same year, and they died the same year too, and they they were close friends from from the from the youth in uh, Romania. And Vintila uh, fled to Argentina because he was more involved uh, in the, um, the, 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 the left, the, the right, the right wing uh, movement in the, in uh, Romania during the war. And uh, uh, Vintila Oya won the Goncourt in sixty in nineteen sixty two, something like this. He asked, and he had to refuse the, to, to to deny the, the Goncourt because. He was accused to be uh, some, some uh, uh, to be uh, an anti-Semitist and uh, to be someone uh, of the right wing, uh, ex far far right wing, ex and uh, the same accusation as George. But for Vitoria, it's more true. That, that this is the, the reason why George was to fly uh, was wanted to spend some time in Argentina. And as uh, Ines said, the, the, uh, at the end of his life, when I when I met him, at the end of his life, George wanted to write his memoir. And the, 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 at the beginning, there they, they would have been seven volumes of these memoirs. Unfortunately, he died before he only wrote the first one. And he left the manuscript for the second one. His widow uh, issued it, issued it, but six or seven years after his death. And then that's that's all. And unfortunately, the second volume ends with the uh, with George and his wife arriving in France. And the third one would have been very, very interesting because the third one would, would have been about um, his, his beginnings in Paris and the, the, the success of the 25th hour. And after this, maybe the George's affair. But you can, as Ines said, the, the third volume of the memoirs is, in fact, his novel, The Man Who Traveled travel Alone, because it's his life. It's exactly what he what, what he has to 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 go through to during to all these years. So, so Shoju was a man. The man I met and I I was close to uh, during six years or seven years was someone very very lovely and very funny and uh, very kind. Uh, but is someone I, I have all all these letters and and diaries and something like this in my in my home since I. I'm the owner of his right, and um, was someone a little bit more intricate that I that I I guess at the beginning, and he, he he wanted to be someone famous. He, he needed it. It's not a shame, but he needed it. And I think that sometimes he made made some mistakes. But just a, that's just a point because he was just a man, so he, a man with and qualities and uh, with his defaults. And it just he was just a man, but someone very very interesting. And I, I think that the affair of Georgiou, the affair of Georgiou, is someone, something very 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 intricate. The the um, extracts from the, the from the from the book they, they put in French to to accuse him are very very um, uh, the, the book is very very. Very strange uh, to read. I, I I I must confess, because George was a reporter of war, of war and he he, he couldn't uh, he, he should have known what uh, happened in Yash, for example. So that's something very strange for me. But the accusators of George are very very um, uh, ugly people. I, I can say it's like they, they 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 did the same with. I don't know if you know this man with Kravchenko. Thierry, who was a dissident? Thierry, excuse me. Yes. Uh, this has all been extremely helpful, and we'll be coming back to you very, very shortly. But uh, our panelist, co host Mario Ramos Reyes, unfortunately, has to go to meetings. So before he goes to any meetings, I want to ask yes. him if he would like to interject any questions here. Okay. Well, uh, I think. 
is very, very, very interesting, very illustrative. I didn't know that he was about, or he was asked to write a biography of Perón. Um, but the, the, yes. But the, the, the issue is, uh, uh, if I understood well, the um, Eva Perón was the one who was first in contact with him. Am I right with that? Yes, uh, he, he, in contact with him as a prisoner. He, 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 when he was a prisoner in the, in the, the American chase, he, 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 the only things he, 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 he got from the outside was uh, it was the package sent by Eva Peron to all the prisoners. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, I had to leave. I have a few educational commitments. Opportunities. <laughs> Thank you. See you later. Good. All right. And and now we can welcome Father Maxim. No, uh, thank you. I'm glad to see you. Sorry for the delay because I had I had a liturgy. I just had finished the liturgy and I came running. You know, I'm Julio Marius, in fact, on, on your screen, so well, I will rename it. Well, clearly you have the right priorities. Now, <laughs> our our uh, programs, Father, are, are conversational. And on more than one occasion, the conversation has been interrupted by our trying to connect with people. And it, it works, but it doesn't quite work. And then it works very well. And all of these things will be dealt with brilliantly by our producer, Sebastian Mafud, who cuts and splices and it does all sorts of marvelous things. Uh, so I'm going to ask you to, to join in at, at this point of the discussion. Uh, but if you work your way back, uh, <clears throat> whether deliberately or indeliberately, that's just fine. Our focus is on uh, the the novel that Inez has has translated, and as I understand it, it's it's only the the second of Georgiou's novels that has been translated into English. Could you tell us something about this novel, uh, La Condottiera, and its place in the other novels that? Uh, that English readers won't have access to. Could you tell us a little bit about this novel and where it fits in, in the work of Georgiou? Well, thank you for the question. As you may know, Virgilio Rio wrote more than 40 novels and at least a few years ago when it has been translated in the Romanian language, Condotiera was considered among the unpublished novels of Virgilio Rio. So it's a great joy that it was translated in English and in the very, very beautiful English language, because I must confess, I followed step by step the translation that, that Miss Stog uh, Ines uh, did it. And I was very happy with the way how she understood the senses and the theological meaning of, of this novel. Virgil Gergiu is a writer which still waits to be discovered. He was translated in more than 40 languages, but the, the, the translations focused on 25th Hours, who was the masterpiece of, of the author and who was screened in 1967, if I remember well, with Anthony Quinn as main character. So Condottiera is among the books that he wrote lately. Uh, 25th Hour was published in 1948 in Feu Croise in France at Plone. And Condottiera is already one of the books that he published late in the 70s when he was already old and he was in the apogee, if, if, I, if this word exists in English, I'm not quite sure, of, of, his, of his career. For this reason, most probably it was not translated. Unfortunately, Georgiou was not translated in English after 25th hour for reasons that are related with his conflict with uh, Monica Lovinescu and Virgilia Runca, an important family of the Romanian exile from France that in a certain point accused him to be an anti-Semite and really managed by cutting some paragraphs of his works and somehow transforming him in a man who was an anti-Semite. At the time, Georgiou didn't react as a real Orthodox priest. He didn't react. In fact, he will become later as a real Orthodox. He didn't react to, to this accuse that it has been uh, offered to him. No, it was 
for the example, it, it would be just simple to say that he was married with a Jew woman because Katrina Burbeshnek, she was a Jew woman and he had a lot of suffering due to this fact from the legionary government. For this reason, he had to leave Romania, to arrive to Zagreb and to work in an embassy while he was a very known writer in Romania. He, he received the Royal Prize for poetry and he was so known. So I'm very glad that somehow with this condottiera, which is a mystical novel, I, I would say, although it has a historical content, very interesting, because you can see here paragraphs from, from the life of uh, Nikifor Krajnik, who, for example, was on one of the most important philosophers from the Romanian interwar period. Unfortunately, he's also not translated in other languages, but he studied in German space, and probably for this reason, he's somehow neglected by the literary criticism and by the philosophers uh, at, up to this moment. So on the other side, it, con it contains references to the life of Wurmbrand because Georgiou speaks there about the fact that the Romanian Securitate was sailing uh, people on a fee of $10,000 and was uh, noticing on the fee that it was there were fruits and, uh, and vegetables sold for this, for this amount. So it was something related with Wurmbrand that uh, Georgiou was at the time for sure informed about. But in the same time, it is, is a novel with a very, very deep mystical mystical content because Georgiou here presents, Condottiera is in fact a metaphor for the Virgin Mary. And Georgiou presents here the, among other aspects that are related with the recent history of the Romania because this is the beauty of the Georgiou's writing. Georgiou always presented the history of his native country, but in the same time noticing the fact that it was a moment when uh, the theology must be taken into account. So in the same time, he's presenting the way how the mystical experience and the fact of being Christians interferes with the communism and not in a very good way. This can be seen in about probably 38 from 44 books that Kiryu published during his life or wrote during his life because not all of them are published. It's now after his death that, uh, his, his death, the, that Mr. Gilibov um, arrived to invite the publishing houses to publish his in the, the, the old the work of Gurgiu because there were a few novels who still are unpublished at the moment. So for this reason, I'm very happy because on one side, you will find here a historical novel related with the recent history of Romania, with the history of Romania in the 20th uh, century. And in the same time, it's related with the way how the Christianity influenced the way of thinking of the Romanian people. Gurgiu was the son of a priest. And his father was his model of his life. He will read, even wrote about him. It, in fact, in France, it was published this novel, I think is uh, De la Ventième Heure à l'heure éternelle, which in Romanian was translated that like uh, with the title from the 25th hour to the hour of eternity, which is dedicated to the history of his father. And this is somehow how the, he was brought to the fact of becoming father because he was influenced by the by his father, by the way how his father lived his prized food and uh, was somehow a, a really, really shepherd of souls. So for this reason, I like this novel, La Condottiera, because in the same time and deeply, more deeply than other books, speaks about the way how the politics come to speak to a country that has uh, deep Christian roots and fails, <laughs> because having deep Christian roots make you to, to, to have this possibility to resist to the ideologizations that often can come from politics. And this was one of the, my, of the points of my thesis, my second doctorate thesis that I wrote it in Rome in the Angelican Pontifical University. That's a lot of context for us. Thank you very much. Now, I have three points that I'm raising with a certain hesitancy because uh, I'm a Westerner. And not only am I a Westerner, but I'm from Los Angeles. And in, in Spanish, I refer to Los Angeles as la ciudad de los ángeles casi perdidos, the city of almost lost angels. Uh, and all of the, the, the points or the questions that I'm going to raise connect only with La Condottiera. The first is, and I, I guess I'm going to take them in what I see as the order of importance. The first is that there is to this reader uh, an extraordinarily 
sharp break between the natural and the supernatural. Um, for example, when I read the uh, essays of uh, Pope John Paul II, he suggests that what we, <clears throat> what we build that is good in this world of ours is drawn into the world to come. And it seems to me that uh, there's a kind of uh, recognition, of course, that the kingdom of God is not on earth, but nonetheless, that what we build here on earth has an enduring value. And when I read La Condottiera, I wondered about that sharp division that I saw. That's point number one. And I can remember it, <laughs> even if everybody else forgets it, because I'm going to introduce two more points. Uh, point number two is that I, I see nothing of, and perhaps there was no possibility of, of a, a political reaction, even if very much underground, to the Soviet occupation. Uh, I could imagine novels written, uh, let's say, about the same time as La Condottiera in, say, South America, in which I would expect to find, or in France, in which I would expect to find some sense of, of some kind of political, even underground political response. What I do see in La Condottiera is the, 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 the easy transition of the thugs among the people to the role of collaborators. And then the last point, and I, I certainly noticed this, there's a discussion of the woman, and I'm here referring to, I, I hope I have the name correct, Sabina, who actually inherited the mill, the mill which plays such a central role in the novel. A reference to the woman as uh, somehow overwhelmingly enticing. And this is on the part of her brother-in-law, but also on the part of, of the poet, who at the end of the day manages to escape. And in his escape leads us to a discussion of uh, how much uh, the American response fails, even though it's uh, a better position than that of the communist response. It nonetheless shares something of the bureaucratization and impersonalization of, of the, the communist response. So we've got three points. The role of the secular vis-a-vis -vis the sacred, uh, the, the nature of, of, of woman and the understanding that's presented of, of the Greek uh, Romanian Orthodox spirituality and and the the difficulty of it seems any kind of political response to the oppression so if inez or father maxime or thierry any one of you want to comment on any one of those points i would appreciate that well in terms of the lack of a response to the communist takeover, uh, there was a very tight security system, which Father Maxim knows a lot about. He actually examined Georgiou's secret police files that they had on him when he was in Paris. And actually, a spy came to his house from Romania secretly, which is uh, fictionalized in the novel, The Woman Who Was a Spy, not uh -huh. translated. <laughs> Let's be on. Uh, and um, so I, I, I think that a lack of a response would hardly have been possible when so many people were informing on each other. 
there were threats if you didn't inform, but Father Maxim could tell us more about that. Father, that's your cue. Well, let's say that I've worked on his uh, security at a dossier in 2017 when I had a scholarship from the Romanian Institute for the Investigation of Communist Crime. And I saw, I was curious to see how the conflict between him and Monica Lovinescu was reflected in the Securitate archives. And I was worried about the fact, I, I confessed at the time to Mr. Gilibov because I wrote both him and to Mr. Chochoi, who's the Romanian translator of Father Gheorghevu's work, asking him for the permission to work on this topic and for help. And at the time, the, Mr. Gilibov sent me two letters from Monica Lovinescu to Father Gheorghevu, where she confesses that she received money for the translation of the 25th hour, fact that she will never recognize. Now, being, going back to the, the Securitate dossiers, I would tell you that there are three dossiers, very consistent dossiers, about more than 150, some of them more than 250 pages. And at the time, there were about eight people sent to, to, his, to follow him. Even this spy who presented herself as being one of his relatives, Jurgen was not very conscious of this moment that she was not a relative and she, in fact, she was sent to kill him. And at the time, uh, there are a few notices about this. I didn't publish them because it was not my task at the time. At the time, I worked only on the conflict. And you know what, what that means when uh, in, the, in a certain moment of their life, his father and his mother wanted to visit Georgiou. Father Georgiou was so scared about the fact they couldn't be they fought their father or their mother because he, nev he never saw his parents after 40, after 1940, when he, 42, I think, when he lived for Zagreb. So for this reason, he actually was scared that they couldn't be his father and his mother. And in one of these letters, he told him, no, please don't come. It's not, <laughs> it's not the time to come. There will be a time. And in the next year, his father died. It was somewhere in 67 or 68. And it was a great, great loss for him. So this man suffered a lot for the Securitate. Securitate was always Romanian security, how we call it, Securitate, was always interested in his work. And in a certain time, they tried to, uh, to, to, to determine him to become one of, on, of ins informers because he knew so many things. In a certain moment, this I must also notice, up to 64, if I remember well, to 1964, there was a dossier on the name of Virgil Gheorghiu and the security that he was fully convinced that Virgil Gheorghiu is still in Romania under a fake identity. And for this reason, he has so many information that he published in his books because it was not possible to know so many things about the abuses made by the communist uh, by the communist regime in order and and to be outside of the country so there was a, a romanian national dossier of following father Gheorghiu, and at the time they were trying to find him and to kill him or at least to imprison him or to annihilate his activity and his father suffered for this his father was at the moment a priest somewhere in the niamts county which is in the eastern part of Romanian Moldavia and the Romanian Moldavia of today. And it was very, very complicated. But for Father Gheorghiu, for example, it was not like for Monica Lovinescu or for others. For others, it was enough to say your, mother's, your mother is here, your father is here. If you are not telling what you are interested to say, we can kill them. He was never threatened by this fact. Even if he was threatened, he never ceased. So he, he stayed vertical from this point of view. And in fact, nothing happens because his father died um, in an old age, but he, yes, he suffered because sometimes he was called to be inquired by the Securitate and he was in, so it was difficult. But in the same time, it's interesting to see how Father Gheorghiu was informed because there were moments when Father Gheorghiu knew before the Free Europe Radio or the Occident what happens in the communist period in relationship between the church and, um, and the state. And he had not a very good relationship with Patriarch Christian Marina, although he had a correspondence on the time. But probably somewhere in, in his relationship with uh, Monsignor Burlia, for example, who was an important re representative of the Romanian exile from Germany, or probably with others, due to his ecumenical relationships that, that, that he developed during his life, he was very well informed. And usually he had information previously to the other people, even to Monica Lovinescu, who was in Radio Free Europe and received anonymous letters from this. And he, he never ceased to valorize this in, their, in, in his books. For this reason, they tried at the time to invite him to Romania in order to imprison him in summer, somewhere in the 70s. In, afterwards, they tried um, to invite him to screen in Romania, to make the movie in Romania, but to give up with the anti-communist passages of 25th hour, he refused. 
And then the last solution was to kill him, like it was for Paul Goma in the same time for Virgil Tanasi. There, there was, uh, I would say, a general tendency of the Romanian Securitate to kill the opponents from the French exile. None of them, uh, if, for example, in comparison with the Bulgarian Securitate, Romanian Securitate managed to kill nobody. And in the end, there were even important officers from the Securitate, from the Securitate like Pleshitsa, who was general, or even the chief of the security, I don't remember now his name, probably Mr. Gilibov can help me, uh, even uh, defected, so uh, switched the side and run away from the, from the country. Uh, at the time, what Gheorghiu managed to show from the political and social political point of view, geopolitical point of view, was to, show, to, to prove that Romania was at the time a penitentiary republic. And I think it was the, the main task of books, like not only like Condottiera, when, where he also speaks, but the mystical accent is the main one, but of books like The Spy or, for example, like The Strangers from Heidelberg and other, The Foreigners from Heidelberg and other books that he also published because there is something like a continuity. If somebody would publish and translate his entire work, it can find that he, he had actually, he don't only publish because he was inspired and he was a novel writer, but he has also a sociological purpose, as I've tried to show to prove in my book published in Peter Lang Press from Berlin in this year. And, and he, he published in order to to protect uh, the Romanians from the aggressions of the, of the, of the communism. Uh, probably Mr. Gilibov could tell you more because he has also the letters of Father Gheorghiu. He, uh, he is the testamentary legacy. And if, I must confess that when I wrote a book about the way how this uh, uh, conflict with Monica Lovinescu is reflected in Securitate Archives, he provided me and not only the foreword, but very, very important documents. And I could confront what I found in the Securitate Archives with what he sent me. And I found, in fact, that the truth was not like Monica Lovinescu, who was an influent personality of the Romanian exile, tried to show it. That's, that's five or six lessons for us all together in, in one. And you sound like somebody who has recently written a dissertation. <laughs> I just well, published a PhD thesis in Berlin in this year, so I, I have graduated my doctor, my second doctorate in 2021. So you're right. Excellent. Now, uh, I want to get Thierry's uh, response to all of this. He's been putting some things in the chat, but but just let me hold off on asking him to join in for just a moment or two. I guess a a lesson for us in the West is. Totalitarianism can be so crushingly, crushingly brutal that the, the best thing we can do is, is to do everything we can here and now to prevent it from coming to pass. We sometimes talk about here in the West a, a soft totalitarianism. Uh, and it, it, it has a, a, a real oppressiveness about it, but at least we can protest. And it seems to me a lesson that we should take from this historical experience that you've sketched is that we should speak up loudly and clearly here and now. Second thought that comes to mind is uh, everything is what it is and not another thing, but we have the Ost politic that was adopted by uh, Rome with regard to Eastern Europe, which was certainly, I th in my view, flawed. But we, we now have a, a certain accommodation in China on the part of the Vatican, which in my view is seriously flawed. But at the same time, there, there ought to be this awareness of just how grave the stakes are for the people who are in these countries. Well, that said, Thierry, could, could you offer your comments on, on what we've just heard? And you will have to unmute yourself. Yes, I, I'm listening. What do you want me to do? To, 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 to add, subtract, or clarify what Father Maxim has just been sharing with us. Uh, as an inspiration for us now? Yes, yes. If, if you would like to develop the commentary that he's already presented us with. I think that 
you know, I read the 21st hour when I was 15 for the first time, and I read it about 10 or 15 times in 10 years. And then I Whoa. didn't read it for, for years, for more than 25 years. And I was invited for the century of his birth in the, in the Bucharest, in Bucharest. And uh, I said, I, I have to read it once again. And of course, I was a man of, uh, of now, I, I was 50 at this time. And I'm, I was not sure the book was so moving as it was, as it was in my, my, in my memory. But when I read it for the, for the uh, maybe 20 feet, uh, I don't know how much times, but when I read it again, I discovered it was very uh, a masterpiece, and it's a, it's a very modern masterpiece. I think that Twenty Fifth Hour, for example, and that some other novels, as the Seventh Chance, for example, uh, is is as big and important a book as, uh, for example, uh, 1984 of George Orwell of Brave New World of uh, Aldous Huxley, because this book is speaking of what happens in our time. And the the, the, the petitions uh, try and Corrigan's writing when he's in the camp is something of the best absurd uh, literature, just like the same as Kafka, for example, or Dostoevsky. But in the case of George, there's something different and something maybe more. It's the, the part of the spirituality. He was a, a very deep man of spirituality, and his book about the Orthodox religion a very, very interesting. I'm I'm a Christian, but I'm a Catholic, and I learn a lot about uh, the, the Orthodox spirituality. Reading George, it opens my it opens my mind, and I think that George is. Uh, I, I I don't I still don't understand why this man is not read more than this because when I speak. So by chance, with some people who read it well, many years ago, they all all they they all say it was such a book. It was such a writer. It is such a writer. I cannot. Nobody understands why he's not uh, one of the most known uh, writers in the world. I mean, you know, you you can't find you can't find the twenty fifth hour in any bookshop in France. You have to order it, but you won't find it in any in any bookshops in France. Uh, I, I, try, I tried it many times, but you can't find it. So if you can't find the book, you can't read it. And for the and nobody's speaking of Giorgio now in France. It's completely uh, uh, for, uh, for, forgotten. It's, it's completely forgotten writer. I, I think this man, because he was against communist, just in the Cold War. And because France, in, in France, just after the war, uh, communists were very, very strong and very, very uh, um, actioning people. And ju just because he was communist, he, um, he was uh, an enemy, but he was also an enemy because he was against the American way of life. So it can't be, it, 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 it doesn't belong to any camp after Cold War. And that's what, I think that's the reason why Nobody is. That's that's the reason why someone uh, writes a very very different and very special, and his personal story is very moving. It's and it's very uh, typical of the uh, history of uh, the people of the of the East of Europe in the twentieth century. Um, for me. I think it does, that, that, for example, a very, very short book of George, the name is uh, Sacrifice of Danube, in, uh, the Sacrifice du Danube in French, and it's a very, very short book. And it's just like um, a drama, but it could be a Shakespeare, it's, it's a novel, huh? it could be a Shakespeare uh, theater or, or a Greek theater, because it's about the human tragedy. Uh, confronted with uh, with the, the the history, and the, 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 this is the, the, the there are many many of, of this of, uh, many books of George was very 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 uh, we need to be read because they, they they help you to understand our time. There's, this is there are not books belongs to twentieth century. There are books who, who belongs to the whole human history, whole human modern history. I think that George is very is, is a witness of our time. 
that's a, that's a way he can help us. He's a witness of our time. And you know, he was um, he was blacklisted because of the affair and the accusation in the beginning of the 50s years. And then he, 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 he became a pope, became a, a priest, and of course, in the France of the uh, at the time of May May uh, sixty eight, it was not the, the, the things to do. So it, it was sometime an enemy, someone you, you despise, someone you 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 fight against him. And after this, yeah, and he became he came back to the. Uh, it came back to the interest of many people when uh, there was the, the with the fall of Ceausescu, because he was uh, he was someone who was was always struggle against uh, Ceausescu, and when Ceausescu failed, he was invited in all the, the newspapers and all the radio and TV and was speaking again, and because people were realizing that he was right about it, he told them for fifty years. And they re realized that he was he was right. He was right about what the communist is, communism is. He was right about was the what happened in Romania because you know the French, the chief of the French Communist Party spent his early days with with uh, Ceausescu, and and George always told about it. The the, the information. We uh, we have about the the Joshua's file in Secretariat that thanks to the father uh, to the father Borrell uh, are very 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 something very important for me. I learned a lot by, uh, thanks to to this uh, to this file because at uh, at big at the beginning was accused to be uh, anti-Semite anti-Semite and after this he was accused to be a spy. Uh, for the Shikori that so he always he has always been an enemy and when you are always an enemy of of this kind of uh, political power it means that you are someone very very uh, dangerous because you 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 are dangerous because you understand what happens and Joshua is is a, uh, helps us to 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 see clearly what politics is theoretically. Yeah. Theoretically, we're at the end of the, the, the hour, but practice, practice, I think, should take priority over theory. But I, I have to check, can you folks stay with us for a bit? Yes. I, I, I see nods. And Thierry, can you stay with us for a bit? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're laughing at the chat here. Sebastian Mahfoud says, till the end of the age. Uh, all right, let's keep going, and let's not worry about the time. Uh, first of all, Inez, uh, can we hear from you again? So much has been said. I wonder if you'd like to, to interject some ideas. And, and after you've done that at your leisure, then I want to return to offer some other thoughts. Yes, you mentioned that uh, one of the things you wanted to address was the difference between the spiritual and the earthly. Yes, so, yes, okay. That's one last thing that I'll have to discuss. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Yes, well, uh, Thierry touched on this in the afterword, his um, really great afterword to the Condottiera about how uh, Georg, the novels rooted in the earth but lifted up to heaven and I think you see that in the difference between the Akathis brothers the priest, uh, Father Theophorus and his brother Nicholas his brother Nicholas likes everything that has to do with the earth he's very practical and Father Theoph Theophorus is of an almost ethereal spirituality who hardly seems like he's made of flesh and blood, uh, who fasts, who has long prayer vigils, but they appreciate each other and love each other very much. Uh, so I guess that would be one point I would want to make. Uh, and yet even in Western monasticism, we have uh, the idea of uh, aura et labora, and we have in this uh, ecologically aware time, a deep 
appreciation of the Benedictine orders, a commitment to the, the place they are in and building it and developing it. And in uh, Alistair McIntyre's famous uh, After Virtue, at the end we have him saying, well, we could go in a Trotsky direction, uh, in which he had flirted with at some time, or we could wait for a new Benedict. And it, it seems to me that uh, there, even within monasticism, there needn't be such a sharp, sharp split. But that's a matter for discussion. Would you like to tackle uh, the, the whole question of the, the place of the woman in La Condottiera? On the one hand, we have the Blessed Mother, a woman who is the guide. And then we have uh, the woman on earth, Sabina, who is someone that the monk is afraid even to look at. And the poet, for all his wonderful poetry, uh, is, is uh, at one point at least, uh, uh, making uh, sexual advances towards. I wonder if you'd like to discuss that, the, the place of the woman. Me? <laughs> well, I, I, think, oh, I think you're the best one. <laughs> I, I think Sabina has to be understood in the context of what's happened to her. Um, she's lost her husband. She lost the mill. And, and she's very, very upset. Uh, and she feels responsible uh, for the murder of her husband, which, of course, she's not. And then there's... Ovid Pontelemon, the poet who has been living more or less in a closet, uh, Georgiou satirizes things, he exaggerates to make a point. So he's been living in this closet and he's, he escapes and he comes into contact with Sabina and it's like he hasn't heard the voice of a woman for so long and he can't help himself. She herself realizes he's not in his right mind. And then you have Father Theophorus who has a certain fear of contact with the feminine because for a monk, it can be threatening. He needs to live his celibate life. And perhaps this is somewhat exaggerated, but it's understandable that he understands how wonderful a woman is. He understands that she's the most beautiful creature of God, but he has his ascetic contemplative life to protect. So, uh, all this is written in a kind of expressionist way. Yes. Uh, but I, I think in, in a very poetic way, when uh, Father Theophorus is the communists cruelly lock them up in the same cell, uh, and, and the, <laughs> it's like a torture, and uh, Father Theophorus comes to terms with and he he helps Sabina. He sees that his role is to be a spiritual father to her, and he encourages her to accept whatever light lies ahead, even if it be death. So uh, they do have, in the end, a very appropriate uh, spiritual relationship. Thank you for that. That's, uh, that's certainly helpful. L let me offer a, a couple more points here, and then I'll encourage everybody to jump in again. Uh, with regard to the neglect of, of our author, Georgiou, uh, there is, a, and I, I think our, our friend Father Maxim would be very attuned to this, a kind of systematic disregard for all things Central European in the West. Uh, there's a kind of uh, snobbery. Uh, we have a, a, a real ignorance of the history of Central Europe and Eastern Europe. Uh, and, and I think that explains in part the neglect here. And then also Thierry mentioned the, uh, the uh, distance that uh, Giorgio put between himself and the West. Consider uh, in like fashion Solzhenitsyn. Uh, Solzhenitsyn was lionized in the West 
when he was seen as uh, first and foremost a, a dissenter against uh, the communism which he had once himself accepted. But lo and behold, when Solzhenitsyn comes to the West and tells the West the truth about the West, he's shunted, he's put aside, he's seen as somebody hopelessly cranky and idiosyncratic and negative and, and all of that. So there certainly is a, a parallel in the treatment of, of those two. Um, well, those those are the things that I wanted to mention. Would any of you like to to add or or clarify or extend? Since we all have a little extra time, Terry, you're you're coming from from Paris, and we. Well, last week on this program, we got to talk to somebody from South Africa, and we thought that was pretty good. And, and now somebody from Paris, that's that's great, too. What else would you like to add? To everything you say. Um, um, I, I, there's, there's something... Um, uh, I, unfortunately, I haven't spoken a lot of uh, spirituality in Joshua. I'd say, I, 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 as I understand the meeting, it was may, maybe the point where you, you wanted to uh, to tell uh, to, to speak of. But I think that uh, Father Morario and uh, Ines uh, would speak better than me about this. Uh, I am do as I told you for for my now fourteen years. I'm the owner of the right of of George's works. It's it's uh, it's a chance. To, it's as a, it's a very long story. I I don't have time to to to, to, to explain it. But I'm I'm I think it's um, for me it's. Uh, um, a mission for me. I want to, to, I'm trying to do my best to make Georgios uh, more and more rediscovered. And I'm very grateful to people like Father Morario, like Ines, all of them were tra tra doing the same and trying to, to make him uh, more read and more discovered by new generations of readers. Uh, I, I really wanted to do this. I, there's, I'm trying to 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 issue his his unpublished books. I have two novels and uh, three novels in France who are not, not, uh, who have not been issued in France and uh, the biography of Saint, Saint uh, Ambrosius of Milano. Uh, the, the, he wrote something the same way he wrote a biography of uh, well I don't know the name in uh, in English Saint Jean Chrysostom Chrysostom was. And uh, I wanted to, to do this book to be issued in France because they are very important in the in Jojo's Jojo work. But I want to 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 write a better biography than the the, the short one I, I did. And I would like uh, what I want to do is um, a very very uh, complete uh, book about the Jojo affair because thanks to Father Morario, I have now the secreted file. Uh, on Georgiou. I have now, I have all the personal archives in my, in my home, uh, the personal archives of Georgiou with many, 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 many uh, unpublished and unknown documents, uh, letters by Monica Lovinescu, by Mitri Eliad, by Gabriel Marcel, because you know, when there was the, when it, there was the affair of Georgiou, Gabriel Marcel, um, uh, take take took back the the forward he wrote for for the twenty fifth hour and uh, and made a clash a public clash with uh, George Wu. But some years after, and nobody knows about this. Some years after, he came back to 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 George Wu and uh, apologized for what he did. So I have that, that it's a I, I want to 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 make a, this book about the first show, but not because of George Wu, but but I think it's a way of understanding what happens in half of the. European continent for about for, for, during more than half of the century, the 20th century. I think that the, 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 the way the West despised those people who fled the, the East European, I, I, I want to, it's very, it's very 
yeah, I think it's kind of uh, memory testimony, uh, historical testimonies, uh, something very important. That's that's uh, what I'm trying to, to do now. I'm trying to, and I'm trying to 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 uh, um, uh, manage uh, for a book because uh, Sadam Rario asked me the book about everything George wrote about uh, religious matters in the, the newspapers. I have found many documents about this, but I have to still um, looking all the documents I own and I haven't, I haven't finished yet. But uh, there are many uh, uh, faces, uh, many faces of George who I wanted to, to make make know to, to to understand better this man because this this man is someone very very interesting interesting and it's not a, only for me it's not only a writer. I personally met him and spent some time with him and I was very close to his to his widow for years. So it's something for me very personal. And uh, maybe yeah, I'm not. I'm too too enthusiastic about about what he works or uh, about his, his works and the and the man. But I'm sure of my test. I'm sure of what I read. I'm sure of what his value is in the literary uh, field. And I want him to get back the 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 the, the place he has to 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 the, the, his place in literature. That's my mission for 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 the years to come. We look forward to your great work, and God give you the strength to carry it through. Father Maxim, yes. your, your final thoughts, and well, be as compendious as you wish. Well, I'm not sure that I would be able to be a to comprime all my thoughts in a few minutes, but I will try. First of all, I really enjoyed the both of the intervention of, of the interventions of Mr. Gillibuff and also of Miss Ines, but. Uh, uh, to Mr. Gilibov, I'm owning an answer. At a certain point when I worked on the Gilgio affair, he asked me, was he guilty or not? And I avoided answering him. Now, after so many digging in the archives and so res many research done, I can answer him clearly. Yes, he was not guilty in the Gilgio affair. He was something that was prepared by Monica Lovinescu. And I'm sorry that at the time, uh, as, a uh, as a historian, I was not able to at the time to be because we are always called to be honest and to be objective in the approach on the other side we must underline what uh, what mr Georgi, what mr gilibov said that Georgiou wrote about the communism and denounced the crimes of the communists with an accent before solzhenitsyn before all the other writers who started to write about this yes. and the sad side the sad part was that he was somehow put at the at the wall by the Romanian writers because being so influent in the Romanian exile from Paris, Georg, uh, Lovinescu family somehow managed to put everybody to be against him. You know, it was and some, somehow still is in a certain points in Romanian space. If you're not with us, you are against us. And uh, this is the saddest part of, Georgius, of Father Georgiou's biography because accepting Choran, who would later join the ones who will become his detractors, Georgiou was also criticized by people like Eliade, who was jealous of his success. And I will find, I will show you if you want this uh, notice by Sandra Stolojan, who was the official translator of President de Gaulle. And she was very close both to Choran and to, to Eliade family. And this was the sad part. And that's why we need, I'm happy to underline the fact that in Romania, if you go today, you will find 25th hour together with all the books of Georgiou, published by one of the most important Romanian houses. Unfortunately, not all of them have and uh, introductory studies that come to speak about the real relevance of the water, but some of them, yes, because I remember now, for example, the man who was traveling alone with a foreword by Kerry Gilibov, who, who is welcome this foreword because it comes to speak about the, the role of the, the work in the, in the entire, the, 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 the artist, uh, archi architecture of the entire work of Georgiou. And yeah, I think it's important to publish all the documents that we have. I must thank Mr. Gilibov because when I published in 2021, a book about this conflict reflected in Securitate dossiers, in the Securitate documents. The One of the points that helped me really, the, the one of the most important pieces of the puzzles, of the puzzle were the two letters that he sent me and that they are the letters of Monica Lovinescu to Virgil Georgiou from 51, if I remember well, when she confesses that she received money. Monica Lovinescu in front of the judge, in front of the authorities of France, she never recognized that she, she never confessed that she received money and she received more than 50%, 15% from what the, from the public, from the copyrights. She received about 31%, if I remember well. So she was not honest. 
with the judge and somehow from the point of the view of a man who represents the Romanian culture, I think this is not good, not fair. So for this reason, among others, we need to rediscover. On the other side, at, at the level of the writing, Georgiou is one of the deepest writers that the world had in the 20th century. I'm not a writer, or if I am a writer, I'm just an amateur compared with somebody like Georgiou. He managed so well to, real, to valorize both the Romanian spirituality, the Romanian culture and tradition, and at the same time, the way of, of the, uh, how the, the international, the Occident, um, managed to, to influence this tradition, at the same time, the way how the Occident in, in, has its own tradition and how we can interact. His main error with the commas, I would say, was that he never affiliated to a certain way of life or uh, ideology of a political regime. He criticized both Nazis, both communist and both uh, American capitalism. And for this reason, today, today I think uh, he's, he's somehow isolated. But it is a pity to not see his, the biographies that he dedicated to Luther, to Mohammed, his relationship with Athenagoras, the patriarch of the, of the Greeks, the ecumenical patriarch, his biography is dedicated to the science or works like Condotiera, which have a deep ecumenical relevance. Uh, at the time, he sized both by people like Charles Westphal or by a lot of, of, of theologians like from the Catholic space. I remember in 2015, I was in the Benedictine Abbey. I'm a, <laughs> I graduated to the Dominicans, Father, <laughs> Father Sebastian. <laughs> I, I graduated to the Pontifical University of the Dominicans in Rome, in Thomas Aquinas. But in the same time, I had a few months when I lived to the Benedictines because my bishop at the time sent me there to, to live among the Benedictines. And the Benedictines were very impressed by Giorgio. The Dominicans knew also his work because they encouraged me to wrote a PhD thesis, this is dedicated to him. But I was very impressed to see what impact had his ecumenical openness in France, for example, among the Benedictines and the Dominicans and the, the, the religious that known him. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Inez, you made all of this possible. You did the translation and you brought with you Thierry and Father Maxim, to whom we are enormously indebted. So could you give us some final thoughts? And don't rush. <laughs> well, I feel very blessed having read so many of Georgiou's works. I like his spirituality. Most of all, that the supernatural is real. Uh, for example, uh, I think it's in La Codotiera, somebody says, oh, he has a little anecdote, it might be from the church fathers, where someone says, oh, somebody died. And a monk says, no, people don't die. <laughs> you know, they pass on to the next life. So I, that's what I like the most about him, that his faith goes into the very fibers of his being and is in all his work. And of course, I like the criticism of um, capitalism. He was very prescient. He saw that in, cap in the capitalistic materialistic system, man became like a clog in a machine. And this is pointed out in a very satirical way in The American Eye, uh, which is kind of a work of science fiction about American domination of the whole world. Uh, so I can resonate with that and uh, the fact that we don't have any political system here, we don't have any way to go forward in the United States. I guess uh, I can appreciate his criticism and uh, I wish that the American Solidarity Party had more traction. <laughs> I think Georgiou would have liked its way of, of being pro-life, pro-environment, pro-peace pro-worker, uh, he, he might have found a third, the third way there that never materialized for him. Thank you for that. Thank you for the mention of the American Solidarity Party. <laughs> uh, we're going to get more traction. <laughs> we just need more feet on the ground, nonviolent feet on the ground. Uh, I'm going to close as we always do with the gospel for today. And this is from the Gospel of John. Since the Passover of the Jews was near, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. He found in the temple area those who sold oxen 
sheep and doves, as well as the money changers seated there. He made a whip out of cords and drove them all out of the temple area with the sheep and oxen and spilled the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And to those who sold doves, he said, take these out of here and stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples recalled the words of scripture, zeal for your house will consume me. At this, the Jews answered and said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them and said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. Therefore, when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this. And they came to believe the scripture and the word Jesus had spoken. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Our, our visitors from afar, thank you so much. Inez, thank you so much for getting this all organized. Oh, thank you, Jim, for hosting it. And uh, Sebastian Mafood, our producer, will uh, edit and put everything together. And usually within a couple of days, he'll send us the finished product, which, of course, when people uh, connect with it, we'll, we'll see it's an unfinished product. There's more to be done. And as our Archbishop says here in Los Angeles, Siempre adelante con juicio. Always forward with judgment. Godspeed. <laughs>